Hi everyone and welcome. I'm here today with Mary Anarella, aka Miracle Knits. She is a knitwear designer and she has over 130 designs, which includes hats, shawls, cardigans. We are going to talk about how, be how she became a designer, what her workday looks like, and of course, about her most recent design, the Muppet Shawl. Welcome, Mary. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hi. Thank, you. Thank you so much for having me here, Linda. Thank you so much for making time for us to chat. I'm so excited. This is, this is my first time doing something like this. So, um, well, we had some technical difficulties, but it looks like we are okay now. 53 seconds and going. So I, uh, I appreciate it so much that you could take the time to talk with me. And can you first uh, tell a little about yourself? Where are you from? Where do you live? Tell me. Uh, right now, I, I have lived in Western Massachusetts for, gosh, almost 30 years now. Uh, when I was younger, I lived around the country because um, my family needed to move. So I've lived in Colorado and Texas and Maine and Pennsylvania. So I've actually lived in Massachusetts the longest. Um, it's, okay, so but you have seen a lot of the country already. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I that's love nice. I love hike and garden and travel. And then okay, it's... but not much gardening at the moment because you just told me it's snowing over there. Yes, I should tell your listeners that I am actually not outside my house. This is an enclosed porch. <laughs> and on the other side of my screen, there's a bunch of snow coming down. That is so cool. I love snow, but we don't have much, unfortunately. Um, were you uh, trained in the creative field or have you developed yourself as a knitwear designer? I'm mostly self-taught. Um, I learned to knit as a kid and I crocheted as well. So, so when I went to knit, I automatically picked up my yarn the same way I would to crochet. So I'm a continental knitter, I found out. Yeah. And uh, I picked it back up again in college when I wanted to make one of those Icelandic wool sweaters with, you know, the color work yoke mm -hmm. and couldn't afford it. <laughs> and so couldn't afford to buy one. So I decided to make one, not knowing that you know, <laughs> the yarn would cost about the same. Um, and I taught myself to knit. And as I moved around the country, I joined knit groups and learned how to do it. But I've never been someone who could just follow a pattern. I always had to change something. Okay. So, and I would think, well, I like this pattern better. So I'll put this color work motif in here instead and things like that. And uh, after I joined Ravelry, I, you know, created a few of my own sweaters and people started to ask for the patterns. So I thought, well, I've, you know, never done this before, but I've done technical writing because my training is actually in math and science. Um, uh -huh. and so basically I consider myself now a fabric engineer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. And is designing your full-time job? Uh, not presently. No, it's about three quarters of my full-time job. I also teach uh, microbiology part-time at a local college. And I love it because it, designing is very isolating. You know, you work alone. Creative work is, is it's a very um, rich interior world that you have. And so I'm still an extrovert and I really enjoy being around young people and students and helping them learn. And I actually teach them some laboratory science which is not that different from teaching a knitting class. And I can imagine that your background in math really helps you in your designing process. It, it really does. Um, occasionally I'll hear people say, why did I have to learn algebra in school? I never use it. And I'm, I <laughs> always say things like, I design knitwear and I use algebra and geometry 
every day. <laughs> All the time, yes, yep. yes. Yep. Okay, okay, Especially thank you. Especially for shawls. <laughs> How did your knitting experience, the way you started, how did this, how did that contribute in your current designs? Hmm. I started off designing exclusively sweaters because that's what I enjoy knitting. I, I love making clothes for myself. Um, and, but I had a lot to learn about how to grade patterns to fit a variety of shapes and sizes. So I, I studied that a lot. I learned a lot just from looking at schematics that other designers used and talking with them about it, about how to, I mean, you can't just, you know, start with a small sweater and make every single dimension that much larger because people don't, aren't shaped like that. People don't get taller as they get broader. So exactly. So you have to learn, you know, when, when to stop making the shoulders so broad. And then learning about the ASTM standards, which I use for sizing, um, playing with geometry and seeing what other designers do. Um, there's an EU designer named uh, Wooly Wormhead who does just mm -hmm. yes. fantastic geometry for her hats. And I just find her color work so inspiring. Yeah, but- um, Yeah, that was one of my questions. Mm -hmm. Are there designers that you are looking up to or that you admire for their certain way of designing, like you just explained, Wooly Warmet, but are there more? Oh gosh, there are so many. There's, there's Wooly's work, um, Unwind Knitwear. Um, I, I forget her full name. <laughs> Uh, but her color work design is just so beautiful. I love her aesthetic. Um, I love Casapinka's work very much. Um, uh, what is her name? Lisa Ross, uh, Paper Daisy, I think. Yeah, is Paper Daisy Creations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she and I have very similar uh, vibes when it comes to designing our shawls. And so that's kind of fun to see how we'll both work within a similar framework and come up with different ideas. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, of course, Andrea Maori and Boy Boylan Knits and Stephen West and Hohi, who is just so adorable. Amazing, yes. Mm -hmm. All very talented designers. And yes. Yes. Um, I am just a design puppy myself now. I think I have 14 designs, I think. Congrats. So I'm still in the process of exploring and coming up with new things. And I just uh, started my first sweater design yesterday for my daughter. So that's all very exciting. So I, I always try to find um, similarities in different designers to see how I can learn from them. And mm -hmm. But it's all very exciting and very new for me. So. Um, but that's okay. We're getting there. Yeah. Um, my next work, question. Yeah. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say that, you know, there's the design, the creative design itself. And then there's the technical aspect of it. Exactly. Of it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And sometimes both are challenging and, <laughs> and sometimes. Yeah. Well, sometimes I, I have an idea in my head and the trouble is getting it to fit in a certain shape or something. So um, I'm learning every day, but um, you with over 130 designs are probably also still learning because yeah. uh, there is so much to explore and so much to design. And um, how do you tackle challenges in your designing process? such as coming up with a new stitch or coming up with new structures? Um, I like to play with geometry a lot in shawls. And so I'll play a little game with myself called what if not? <laughs> um, <laughs> or, or, or just what if, what if I'm, what would happen if I moved the increase the, the spine on a triangle shawl, what if I moved it over here? What happens? Um, yes, like you did in your uh, Who You Gonna Show yes, shawl. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's exactly what happened with that one. 
Um, sometimes I get myself into a little trouble <laughs> because as you know, knitting experiments take materials and time. <laughs> yes, it's all part of the job. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, um, and, and this is where being a, a, a bit of an engineer really helps. Like, like um, you know, how do I raise the back of the neck on of a sweater if it's going to be seamless? And then you realize, oh, I'll use short rows. Um, and I remember Hohe asked once, she was doing a circular sweater. I forget the name of it, but it had one row stripes, but short rows require two. Yes. Right? So, so you, you know, knit around and then you have to turn and use it. And so, so we were saying, oh, I think what you have to do, it's like single color brioche. You have to do one of the short rows with one color and then slide your needle back and come around and do the other. So um, it, it, it's, it's very mathematical. And sometimes you have to ask, you know, does this problem have a solution? <laughs> and if it does, is it satisfying to knit? And is it uh, explainable to other knitters? Yes. Because sometimes something happens in your head and when you try to get it on paper and mm -hmm. well readable for other people that's a whole new thing right yes 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 and yeah. that's where videos can help too to support yes. if you can do a demonstration with a video or a drawing it can really help yeah. people and you get your uh you get a lot of creativity from movies and series and tv shows and songs and it kind of became your thing. Yeah. And how did that start? Was it just because the title spoke to you or what happened there? Right. Well, I, I started out being, in, being inspired by music because I'm also a singer. Um, and then I, things just kind of morphed. And I, I it's, it's so in, energizing to listen to someone else talk about something that they're excited about. If, uh, I'll, I'll hear some of my students who are in, you know, in their t early 20s talk about something in pop culture. And it's just, I'm, it's nothing I would know about, but I get excited just listening to them. So when I first started doing mystery knit-alongs, I remember I was lying in bed one morning, <laughs> you know, just on a Sunday morning where, where I could snooze for a little while. And I had been watching the British, uh, Great British Bake Off. Yeah, which I love. Um, I love to bake. I love to eat. And I, I love that show. And I was lying there and I was thinking, I should do a mystery knit along about this. That would be so much fun. And we could have recipes and I could do it in clues and that, that mirror the show. And all these ideas just kind of fell into my head. So no soggy bottom, <laughs> no soggy bottom. <laughs> With many layers. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> to exactly. have a, a technical challenge <laughs> and a showstopper. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, and then it turned into movies. Um, I remember thinking, um, uh, well, I love Monty Python. That was the first movie one that I did. And I don't know, my partner and I were just talking at, at over dinner one time and I said something about, oh, well, what about the knights who say knit? Knit. <laughs> so, <laughs> that happened. <laughs> I try to find things that people will really enjoy and have fun because with, you know, not everyone is comfortable doing a mystery knit along, not knowing what they're going to end up with. But if they have something fun along the way with a topic that, you know, just brings them joy, that that's so much fun. So I actually um, took a poll of knitters from my newsletter one time and Muppets was right near the top of the list. So I thought, well, I love Muppets. So <laughs> let's do it. Let's do this. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, I had a question a little further up in the list. Oh, yes. Um, which kind of follows up this one. Your upcoming design is the Muppet Show. Choosing names for a project can be a challenge, but it feels so good if the name is right. 
I think that my personal favorite knitting pattern name is I am Groot, Cardigan of the Galaxy. Oh, I just had to knit it because of the <laughs> name. I was eager to tell people what I was working on just so I could tell them I am knitting I am Groot, Cardigan of the Galaxy. <laughs> so do you think, <laughs> do you think uh, projects with good names attract more knitters? I think they do because it just adds to the fun. And again, that was that was something that came up over dinner with my partner. And I said something like, I should do a series because we had just watched the movie Guardians of the Galaxy, the first one. And I said, I should do a cardigan of the galaxy. And <laughs> yeah. people, people love a good pun and people love even a bad pun sometimes. <laughs> true, true. That can work out just as well. Yes. And how do you navigate the trends in the knitting world? And how do you incorporate them in your new designs? Um, do you follow trends or do you just do your own thing? Um, I, I, I can't say that I just do my own thing because I think we're always influenced by what we see. I'm online a lot and I, I see what my students like to wear. Um, if it's a sweater, I usually start off with something like, you know, do, do I do I have space in my own wardrobe for something? Um, but I'm usually late to a trend um, because I tend to like a very classic fit. And when something new comes out, I'm thinking, you know, I'm not so sure about drop shoulders because um, I'm very broad shouldered. And so I tend not to wear those. But then I would ask myself, how can I make this work anyway so that so that, you know, I'm happy with it, too. And so I found that going with a drop shoulder with a little less ease than than a lot of, you know, off the rack drop shoulders would have really helped it work for me. It was just more comfortable for me to wear with, you know, the skirts that I tend to tend to wear. So I'm I'm right. I'm always a little hesitant with a new trend like, you know, puffy sleeves. I'm thinking do I want to spend time <laughs> all the extra time doing a big puffy sleeve? Is it practical where I live? It's cold in the winter time, so I need to be able to fit a coat over something. So big sleeves might not be something that is very practical where I live. So, but I, I definitely, I, I come to them a little later. Um, Boylan knits um, with, with all of her round yoke sweaters and uh, Je Jennifer, I, I forget her last name, Weisman. Not sure. Steinglass. Steinglass, yes. Yes. So those were very popular and I wasn't sure how to shape those. So I waited a long time before I got into them because I wanted to see, I wasn't sure about how to grade them for different sizes. So I waited quite a while until I saw them on lots of different bodies and could figure out, oh, you know, um, uh, you want to make sure that that the underarm doesn't, you know, come too low for someone's comfort because, you know, we don't get wider and longer at the same rate. So I try no, to exactly. keep them a little, you know, higher. <laughs> so. yeah. And um, I, I think that's a challenge all by itself because uh, you can knit something for yourself but uh, if you are very tall and very petite, for example, or if you are um, a bit on the more fluffy side, then you can design it on your own body. But mm -hmm. you need to grade it for other bodies. Do you do your grading yourself or do you have a tech editor doing oh, the grading? For oh, I, I do my own grading and then I have a tech editor take a look at it. Um, and you know, just go through all the typos and everything, but also to look at the sizing. And for sweaters, especially if it's a, a shape of a sweater or a style of sweater construction that, that I haven't, don't have quite as much experience with, I, I rely on test knitters to give me feedback yeah. about, you know, where they need the underarm, how much ease they prefer. Yeah. Do you have a, a set group of test knitters or do you always uh, work with different people? Um, both. 
I have people who have tested it for me many times, but usually, and I started off keeping a Google Doc and a spreadsheet of everyone who had tested it for me and and the like, and then then I just got too busy <laughs> to maintain that list. So now I just ask people on Instagram and in my Ravelry group that you know if you're interested in testing for me, you know I'm I'm looking for knitters in these sizes. Um, or, you know, I'm, I'm still looking for someone with the, you know, with the size 50 or something like that, um, because I'll get, you know, a bunch of testers in certain sizes, but not necessarily across the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the whole size inclusivity thing is also from a re more recent date because, well, a few years ago, there was just a small, medium, large, extra large, and that was it. But now we have um, this whole size inclusivity thing going on. And if you are not size inclusive as a knitwear designer, and some people might say, okay, well, I won't knit your designs. Mm -hmm. Not even because their size is not in there, because it might be in there, but just to support size inclusive knits. Yep, yep. And it's it's great. I mean, we, we should be sizing things for for most knitters, you know, I mean, there will probably always be someone who's smaller or maybe larger, but really, um, I think what happened is that when I first started designing sweaters, I would just look and think, well, okay, everything on, you know, nitty seems to go up to a 48 bust. So I thought, well, okay, I'll, I'll grade to a 48 bust. And then people asked for more. So I thought, well, okay, I can do that. And so it's, I always try to go up to at least a six, to, to fit a 60 inch bust. So if there's a couple inches of ease, then I'll, I'll grade, grade the bust line to measure to 62, 63. Yeah. So yeah, no, it, okay. it's a good thing to include more people. And sometimes, yeah. sometimes a design has to change too. Right, like if you're doing color work, um, exactly. you need you need more increases there so that you know the the underarm isn't halfway to someone's elbow in a size you know 58. So the design yeah. may have to change. You may have to add a little more color work. And uh, what are some key considerations when choosing yarn for a specific pattern? Do you have a favorite way to work with? Ah. Oh. I'm one of these folks who has kind of a ridiculous stash, although I've been much better about it in the past five years or so, because um, believe it or not, I don't have as much time to knit <laughs> as, as people might think, because I'm spending a lot, so much of my time writing the patterns and yeah. designing them and ripping it out and starting over. Um, so I'll try to shop from my stash and let the yarn tell me what it wants to do sometimes, but other times I'll have an, an idea and I'll think this really needs to be fingering weight with mohair, you know, <laughs> that, that I will want that. And so I'll have to go look for the yarn. And in that case, you get to buy something new, which is always nice, right? <laughs> That's right. And I, I actually live near Webb's. Um, oh, okay. Which is now owned by Lovecrafts, mm -hmm. uh, which is a UK company. So it's a very large yarn store. Um, so uh, it, it's easy to find yarn in my neighborhood. And your patterns are seamless, fun to knit, from clear patterns sprinkled with a bit of cheeky humor and fairy dust. I found it. Um, how do you ensure that your patterns are accessible for beginners yet challenging for the more advanced knitters? Yeah, that, that's always a challenge. Um, the first thing that comes to mind, and I, I do feel it's very important, that if I have a chart, a charted uh, like lace pattern, that I, I have to put line by line directions. Um, there are knitters who thrive with charts and and that's me. I'm I'm a very visual knitter, um, but there are, there are knitters who don't care for charts because they can be confusing sometimes and really need the line by line. So for a beginner, if you have both line by line and chart charted 
work in a pattern that lets them choose. It it lets it lets anybody really check their work as well. So they can look they can look at the chart and then make sure that you know what the chart is telling them in their head matches the line by line directions. So that's really helpful. Um, I also do some different constructions that um, that I, I say an adventurous beginner could do. Uh, so I try to have photo tutorials like my set in sleeve, my seamless set in sleeve has a photo tutorial so that you can check your work. Um, I, I, I liken writing a pattern to creating a, like a lab manual or writing a recipe. So I try to describe what that is. Like, don't just say fold in the cheese. If there's, <laughs> there's an American TV, uh, Canadian TV show <laughs> that, that has a joke about fold in the cheese and they don't know what that's about. So you have to describe what it is to fold in the cheese. <laughs> so you need to uh, be very complete in your pattern. In, writing as well as the charts, mm -hmm. charts, yes. And having a technical editor read through it is so essential, not only to make sure that the stitch counts are perfect, but to make sure that it has readability, that it makes sense. Sometimes a tech editor will recommend um, phrasing something differently. And so, you know, you have to be open. When, when you were the writer, you know, we know what's in our head as writers, but it really takes someone else to read through it and edit it. Um, it's so difficult to edit one's own writing. That's very difficult because it's not important what you want to tell, but it needs to be what others can read and understand. So I think we are kind of blind to um, our own well, flings in a pattern. So it's always good to have a tech editor read through it. Yes, that's true. And um, there are so many programs to design knitwear nowadays. Do you uh, design digitally or do you design on paper? And do you make mood boards or what does, what does it look like when you design? <laughs> I, I've never really, I, I mean, Mood boards are pretty to me for me to look at, and it'll. It, I use them more for a color. It's so much time. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is a lot of time. Um, I'll start just drawing something either on paper or I have an iPad, and I I'll sketch things out in Notability, and I'll keep things that way because I can change colors faster there. Um, but then when it comes to to writing the pattern itself it's all it's all on my computer um yeah for charts i use uh the stitch mastery program from kathy in the uk it's an excellent program um i it makes charting so much easier <laughs> yeah i can't even imagine how it used to be <laughs> right, right. And when I'm, yeah. when I'm creating a sweater pattern, I do that all in Excel. That, that, that's much faster because I can set up equations. And what I do is, you know, across the top, I'll have the different sizes. And then I'll set up equations for like how many stitches I need to get to that size and how many increases. And you can pop the row gauge and the stitch gauge into it. So... Yes, and then when you change one number, your whole Excel will change accordingly. So, yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, that makes life so much easier. How do you handle copyright and intellectual property considerations when it comes to your knitting? Um, I just put the general, you know, copyright, Mary Annarella, all rights reserved for whatever that means in work whatever country anyone is in because copyright rules are different depending on the country um but i'm fine for example with um knitters selling pieces that they make for my patterns that's fine copyright in at least in the us is only for for the words on the page 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And with, with references to things like um, song titles that I might use or, you know, the Knights Who Say Knit or Who You Gonna Shawl, talking about Ghostbusters, that I've spoken with copyright lawyers and it comes under something called fair use. So you're allowed to refer to things. I just don't use their images and um, or, or violate their copyright by taking their words and putting them into my pattern. And your Muppet Show will be a five clue show yes. and it will the first clue will drop on march 1st i'm Correct. not sure march 1st okay. it's a friday okay. and i'm telling people eight i'll have it up by 8 a.m that morning eastern time <laughs> i have some knitters in australia who who would say it's <laughs> Who's out? I'm like, I need March to be yeah, yeah. So, but depending, I may, I may need to put it out the night before. Sometimes, if if I know that I'm going to be out late that night. So, and um, how many mystery knit-alongs did you do so far? So far, let's see. I did till the cowls come home, which was a cowl. Uh, three Great British Bake Offs, <laughs> um, Knights Who Say Knit, Princess Bride, As, as You Wish, um, Ghostbusters was last year. So this is what my eighth. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That is very impressive. Yeah, yes. It's, um, it's the most fun that, that I have writing. I love writing a mystery knit along and... I used to think, why would anyone want to knit something that they didn't know what it was going to look like at the end? And the answer is because it's just fun. <laughs> it's it's fun to get a surprise. It's fun to knit it along with other people and see what different color combinations that other dyers and knitters have come up with. And it's it's so enjoyable. Yes. Well, I, I can imagine that so many people are looking forward again to your new Muppet show. Do you have a favorite Muppet, by the way? It's hard not to choose Kermit. <laughs> because he's, he represents everybody. He's every frog. Um, but because I've worked in a lab, I do have a fondness for Beaker. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's so cute. <laughs> Is so cute, and I love Rizzo the mouse, uh, the rat. <laughs> but there are so many, so many, and it's hard to choose any one of them. So I think you might be, um, you made a very good choice by picking Kermit. <laughs> you can't go wrong with any Muppet. No, that's true. So um, this was about my list of questions that I wanted to ask you. Um, I want to thank you for making time to chat with me today yes. and um, I hope that um, many knitters enjoy watching um, and seeing who Mary Annarella really yes. is. So <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. This was very fun and I okay. hope you have a great day. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, it's already, it's nearly six in the evening here, but uh, you have a great day. <laughs> and um, thanks again. And I can't wait for March 1st to start the Muppet Show. Great, great. Well, I'm looking forward to it as well. Okay, well, bye-bye right. then. All right, be well. Bye. <laughs> bye now. Yeah.